We have a wonderful show planned for you today. Uh, we were going to address uh, some new developments in the Parkland uh, Judge Defense Team saga. What's happened is it appears that the uh, there has been a complaint filed against uh, the judge in the uh, Parkland case for her conduct towards the defense attorneys. In return, and probably unrelated, one of the defense attorneys for the Parkland defense team is being investigated for her conduct during the trial. And in that complaint, it doesn't say explicitly that she uh, was being investigated for flipping off the judge, which she didn't flip off the judge, but she, the cameras caught her flipping off somebody, and it made Nicholas Cruz laugh. And uh, people have been referring to that and have been incensed ever since. So they're both under investigation so much. The judge is not really in under any investigation other than there was a complaint filed against her. Uh, the Florida State Bar actually lodged an investigation, launched an investigation into uh, the defense attorney's conduct. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, the growth of this show uh, where the last video, and you have to understand, we started as a very small channel. When Ileana and I, when Ileana and I started this show, it was going to be just, you know, run of the mill general legal advice for general legal issues. And we even if you go back into some of our videos, we're, we're talking about specific legal issues and how to navigate, for example, your family law case, your divorce case, your uh, alimony case, child support, whatever it was. What it has, it has turned into is offering this commentary on some of the uh, most popular trials that are ongoing um, in the modern day zeitgeist, which is what we're doing. And since then, our last video um, has produced, uh, at the time of the recording of the show, uh, just under 14,000 views. Uh, the one that we did prior to that has amassed almost 6,000 views. And Ileana, if I were to tell you that the number of views that we get in any of our content, if we were to stack them all up one on top of the other, that we would literally fill up Crypto Arena. Like we're sitting here in this studio on our microphones and the entire Staples Center, what well, formerly known as the Staples Center, is sold out. Uh, what would you have thought? I would not have believed it. And it's so crazy that now with the technology, we can reach so many people compared to many years before where we needed to go somewhere and like you said, fill out an arena to get this type of audience. Well, it's you amazing. have an audience and people are, are pleased generally with the work that we've done, <laughs> the analysis that we provided. Um, there was, um, there hasn't been a lot of negative feedback, you know, I think we pissed off some defense attorneys. It's going to happen. And with some of our analysis, and I have some further thoughts after having a week to think about it and the emotions of that trial have kind of died down um, and everybody is thinking more level headed um, as to that. But one of the comments that we got was, wow, this is the most bizarre video I've ever seen. And <laughs> I tuned in for legal advice. And what I got was mindless dribble. He said dribble. I think he meant to say drivel. Mm -hmm. um, and what I have to say to that is... You know, um, our legal analysis on that specific uh, subject could have taken 90 seconds, 120 <laughs> yeah. seconds, uh, five minutes. I think that the last case, specifically the Parkland case, um, there was a lot more humanity involved. And we do provide uh, legal analysis on this show. We do it, however, um, with a hint, not even a hint, we always want to keep in mind uh, what is going on with the people in the trial. As an attorney, and honestly, just as a person in general, I've always been, the, the most compelling stories when you watch trials is not the academics of it. I mean, that's all well and good. That's great for some people. But most people, there is drama in it. You know, the defense attorneys have sat there and they've litigated this case for the better part of a year trying to spare the life of a convicted murderer 17 times over. And uh, the uh, families of the victims have had to endure the defense of this young man, Nicholas Cruz, who murdered uh, their loved ones. And the judge has had uh, a very real role in all of that. On all of these cases that you see in the movies, whatever it is mm -hmm. that you, your, your favorite movie of choice with Matthew McConaughey starring, or whoever it is, uh, the Lincoln lawyer, um, 
whatever it is, they're based off of, for the most part, I mean, stuff that is played out in real life, in real court. And there's freedom on the line. There's life and death on the line. And these people have real emotions. And if we're able to make a connection between what the lawyers do and representing their clients and what the people are experiencing and what they feel going through these cases, that's what I'm most interested in doing. And I think that that's what we do on the show. Um, and, and to that regard, as far as the mindless drivel comment, all I have to say to that gentleman is with all due respect, have you listened to what 95% is said in a courtroom? Yes. 95% of it is mindless <laughs> drivel. We speak in codes. We speak in laws. We speak in statutes. We speak in uh, case law, mm-hmm. um, whatever it is. And we have these things that we say over and over and over again to the point where some of these quick hearings that last 90 to 120 seconds, it's just we're going through a routine of saying, oh, yes, this, this, and that. We wave mm-hmm. this and that, and we'll see you all in 30 days, 90 days, 120 days, whatever it is. It's automatic. It's rote, you know, and, and we're not going to, you know, do that all the time. As far as the mindless drivel comment also, did you watch the Daryl Brooks case? <laughs> did you see some of the objections to the, 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 the Parkland stuff with the, the impact victim statements? Because I would argue and I would venture a guess that a lot of people agree that what came out of the mouths of Mr. Daryl Brooks with his sovereign citizen arguments and with the objections made by the Parkland defense team was nothing short of mindless drivel. (laughs) And to that regard, uh, let's get in uh, to some of what we have. Uh, The Parkland defense attorney, um, as we had mentioned, uh, the Florida Bar Association, they have launched an investigation into Nicholas Cruz's attorney, um, likely because of the inappropriate conduct of him or or her uh, flipping off the judge. Um, There was an article from the New York Post uh, where they highlighted it, specifically stating that there was a lawyer for Parkland, massacre killer Nicholas Cruz, who appeared to raise her middle finger to cameras during the sentencing phase of his trial. Uh, She's being investigated by the Florida State Bar. There was footage of the incident that shows public defender Tamara Curtis annoyedly noting a cameraman pointing a lens in her direction before the start of a court session. She then appears to confer with Cruz and another member of her team at the defense table before waving at the camera and raising her middle finger while scratching the side of her face. And this entire time... I mean, I, I did see the video of that. I didn't see it in real time. I just mm-hmm. assumed uh, that, it, you know, the judge was in the room. But it turns out that that's legitimately what happened. Uh, there was nobody else in the courtroom. Apparently, it was a recess. The camera people were setting up, and they were allowed to film inside that courtroom. There was a lens pointed at her. Um, granted, I've never been on a TV trial where mm-hmm. my hearing was televised. Yeah. But I could imagine if I'm in the heart of a defense you know, my defense of anybody and they're pointing cameras in my face, I might feel a certain way. I don't think that it would flip the camera (laughs) off. Uh, That's just not a a part of my regular uh, course of conduct, but she decided to do that and it got a laugh out of Nicholas Cruz. And I think that more than anything uh, caused the outrage of many Mm -hmm. people that viewed that incident. And I think a lot of people are not aware that the judge was not in the courtroom when that happened. I think people are assuming that she was in the courtroom just because of the way that that trial was going for the entire time. And um, just to give you an idea of what uh, was going on in that case, um, that entire trial was wrought with um, conflict between the judge and the defense attorneys. And people are claiming, and a lot of the comments that we got in our last video was, you guys are not defense attorneys, and you're, you know, that judge was totally biased, and, you know, um, you don't know what it's like or what they go through, and they, she shouldn't have been, treated the defense team that way. And to that I say, first, I am actively a criminal defense attorney. I have in the past represented people whom the people watching this video Uh, would not view in any higher esteem than Nicholas Cruz. And my opinion and my perspective on the defense team and their statements and my statements regarding their objections to the victim impact statements was in my capacity as a criminal defense attorney. I was offended as a practicing defense attorney for the way that they conducted themselves. I have a lot of friends who are public defenders, I have a lot of friends who are prosecutors. None of them are in agreement with the conduct or the way that it was presented. I recognize that there are defense attorneys out there that would defend the conduct because 
in the heart of trial, you know, things happen, emotions are running high. And in a case like this, where you spent the better part of a year preparing for and presenting your arguments in a trial like this, it's going to take its toll. Your emotions are going to be fried. And um, I understand why they were angry. My criticism is I've been on that end where I've been in trial and I've lost a case where I wholeheartedly believed in the innocence of my client. It was the only trial that I've ever lost in a jury trial capacity. And I put everything that I had in that case and it was lost on the strength of, uh, well, the reason why we lost that case, in my opinion, was because one of the witnesses testifying on behalf of the defendant just didn't come off very credible and is at a very late stage of trial. And it had, I think, the tendency to flip the jury in that case. So what happened was when that trial went to deliberations, I mean, I think the trial deliberated probably for four or five days or something like that. I remember it was in Riverside County. And I was thinking the entire time, the longer that the jury is out, I mean, we're probably going to get a mistrial or a hung trial, not a mistrial, a hung jury or something, either a hung jury or not guilty. So we get back and, you know, they're reading the verdict in the room and I'm standing next to my client and he was convicted for, of well, at that time, he was allegedly charged with child molestation of three young girls. And the facts of the case just very generally, were that he committed these acts while there were other people in the room and the incident would have occurred within full view of everybody that would have been in that room. And we went through trial and established uh, the locations of everybody, what was in their view and what was not, who was in the room at the time. There was even specific uh, time cues, as in there was a movie uh, that was playing on scheduled television not streaming, and they were all watching it at the same time, and they all made reference to uh, various, uh, Titanic was the movie, oh. to various scenes <laughs> in the movie to corroborate that they were there at those specific times. Um, and so the jury, it was a tough case. Anytime you have a, a molestation case like mm -hmm. that, imagine yourself sitting on the jury. I used yeah. to, before I was attorney, I used to think like this. I used to think like, how could I ever defend uh, somebody that was accused of such a thing? Because mm -hmm. what if I'm like such a good IT, uh, 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 such a good attorney that I just win the case, but he was guilty anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. I used to think that way in law school. I thought that way as a young practicing attorney. Um, and then I got thrown into the fire where, mm -hmm. well, now I'm representing one of these folks. And um, when you're in the battle like that and you're, you have to understand the way that these cases are presented in the media, mm -hmm. They're presented as if it was like a factual timeline of events. Yes. Like uh, when they uh, report the, the incident of Nicholas Cruz or even this, um, there's this new, uh, new trial. It's not a new trial, but they're in closing arguments about this extreme skier that killed his uh, girlfriend. They're in the closing arguments. But the okay. way that that was reported in the media was this very timeline, um, fact-based, as if it were true. Are you talking about Gabby Petito? No, 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 not the Petito case. I'm talking about, there's this new case that we haven't mm -hmm. talked about, but... There's this one where this guy uh, killed his girlfriend. He's on trial for her murder. They're in closing arguments, but the way that it was portrayed in the media, such as the way that it's been portrayed by Nicholas Cruz um, or the Nicholas Cruz case is that all these things happen as if they were true, mm -hmm. not as if they're allegations. And the old adage goes that you're uh, innocent until proven guilty, mm -hmm. right? But when it gets reported in the media, yeah. it's reported as if you're guilty. So that's how the public gets it. When I get these cases, I'm getting it from the defendant's perspective. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. I've been arrested for this crime. I didn't do any of these things that they're saying I do. There's no way that I did those things. And what are they saying? And there, you know, there's this, this anxiety that uh, when you're doing a consultation on a criminal case, whether it be a DUI, whether it be an assault and a battery, whether it be a murder case, um, when somebody genuinely believes that they're guilty or you genuinely believe that they're guilty, they're telling you a perspective um, that is coming from them. And so they're presenting it from the aspect of they're innocent. As an attorney, you have to take what they're saying, obviously with a grain of salt. Um, but you have to understand, too, that there is going to be discovery. You're going to get, if, if they got him on surveillance footage committing this crime, you're going to figure that out. But at, this, at the same time, I always tell my clients like this, look, if everything is as if you said it, mm -hmm. then I'm going to get to the bottom of it and we're going to get, get this case dismissed. But I'm going to get the discovery from the DA 
And uh, you and I are going to go through it together page by page. And then we were going to reassess, mm-hmm. right? And uh, more often than not, and I'm not making any statements about the percentage of uh, criminal defendants who are actually guilty, but more often than not, when I go through the evidence, the guy is guilty. Yeah. Based on what comes out, because they got him in a, confes- a confession, they got him recorded somewhere, or just the evidence is not overcomable. And so, but that doesn't always happen. You know, sometimes you get these cases where his story makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And in light of what he's saying, the prosecution's allegations don't make any sense. And so there's been a handful of cases that I've taken on where I genuinely believed in the innocence of my client. Those are the cases that I take to trial. The other cases where the evidence is obvious, like you're not getting off of your DUI, you blew a 1.8 or a 0.18. They they caught you asleep in the car when you were parking on surveillance footage with the engine running. You're you're Mm -hmm. cooked. There's nothing you can do. And no, they didn't violate your civil rights. I promise. I looked. (laughs) So, um, to that regard, the job of a criminal defense attorney is twofold. My approach anyway, Eliana, maybe you could speak to this, mm-hmm. is if my guy is guilty and he's a young kid and he didn't murder 17 people, let's just say he got a DUI, he did mm-hmm. something really stupid, 22 years old, he was out partying with his girlfriend or his mm-hmm. friends or whatever, and uh, he came home at four in the morning, um, he made a really bad decision, he drove home drunk. Um, and it was his first offense, and now he's he's worried about it. I mean, that's a very easy case. Mm-hmm. Number one, the evidence is you're not going to get off on this charge. No. There's a chance, sure, but are you going to shell out all that money to maybe um, invalidate the blood alcohol levels mm-hmm. or the evidence, or, or whatever you want to argue, a chain of custody? Whatever you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, on the off chance that, that works, great. I don't think that you have the money as a 22-year-old college <laughs> student to defend it. Why don't we do this? Why don't we just we get you the statutory minimum? Exactly. Um, we will do everything we can mm-hmm. and you'll comply with whatever and you will move on with your life and never do this ever again. Learn from the experience. Or if it's like a domestic violence case mm-hmm. where um, I had a case where a young lady threw a cell phone at the face of her boyfriend because she went through his phone and mm-hmm. found out that he was talking to like five other girls. I'm exaggerating the number of girls, but he was talking Still, to other folks. Even if it was just one, yeah. <laughs> she gets pissed off and then winds up like Nolan Ryan. You guys don't know who Nolan Ryan is. I know who he is. No. Um, you guys don't know any baseball pitchers? No, you're talking to the wrong person. Yeah, I, I definitely oh, am. She I'm... winds up full on like she's about to throw a 100 mile an hour fastball and just clocks the guy straight in the face. Blood dripping down his nose. And um, yeah, she got charged with domestic violence, assault, battery, and all those things. Um, in the course of all of that, am I arguing that she did it? No, because she confessed to oh, the, the cops course. what she did. And she's asking, what could I do? I can't have a felony on my, uh, on my record because mm-hmm. she wanted to be a nurse. So, um, but she told the cops that, yeah, I threw my phone, but she tried to say, because I was afraid Excuse and, you know, you. I got upset. Mm-hmm. And then I was afraid afterwards, like after the fact, because he was really mad because he just got clocked in the face <laughs> with a cell phone. And so he was like, what did you do? He didn't even put his hands on her. Like, I mean, I've seen those cases go mm-hmm. the other way. Yes. Anyway, long story short, I negotiate with the district attorney. Mm-hmm. My client's an idiot. She did something very stupid. She knows that she, what she did was really dumb, mm-hmm. right? I can't go back and take that back. Mm -hmm. At the same time, she's really, really sorry. These two have broken up. They've both moved on. Why don't we keep a criminal protective order in place? Why don't we revisit this case in six to eight months? Why don't we do something where she's not pleading to a felony, Mm -hmm. but she's still paying for what she did and everybody can move on with her life and she could resume her career as a nurse? Oftentimes, that's the job of a criminal defense attorney. It's Mm -hmm. not that we're trying to, um, you know, magically make the charges disappear. Mm-hmm. And then very few times we have these cases where we're legitimately arguing for the innocence of our client. And, you know, that's where all the movies are made. That's where, yes. you know, the Matthew McConaughey <laughs> comes in as the Lincoln lawyer <laughs> and wins the big case or Samuel L. Jackson comes in. What's that movie? Uh, the one, uh, I forget. I'm not going to try mm-hmm. to remember movies, but you know, you get the point. Yes. And, and so what's your perspective as a criminal defense attorney, Ileana, as to what the job is about. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, if 
it's pretty clear that the person is innocent, of course, you take it to trial. But otherwise, as if the evidence is there and the client did it, just try to get it to the lowest, I guess, uh, charge and try for the person to move on. And depending on, like you said, their jobs or their, um, I don't know what they do in their life, um, just try to work around that. And that's pretty much it. I mean, I don't do, of course, a lot of criminal cases, but the few that I've done, that's usually like the goal. Yeah. So in the, in the case of like this Parkland uh, death sentence trial, mm-hmm. what these defense attorneys, and I think why the backlash was so severe against them, including from people like myself, and of course they have their defenders and they're, you know, I understand why people are defending them. And I'm going to get into the conduct of the judge in that case. Um, but what they were attempting to do um, I'm sure you're familiar of Clarence Darrow, you know, the greatest American mm-hmm. attorney of all time. Um, he's like the Babe Ruth of the attorneys. He may or may not be the best, but he was, he's the most um, renowned. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what he was famous for was arguing these death penalty cases and sparing the lives of um, disenfranchised youths mm-hmm. from getting at that time would have been an electric chair, mm-hmm. you know, but in his arguments, and in his impassioned to please, which was sometimes back in those days, they didn't limit your closing arguments to an hour. They would go for days. And he would be there, sweat pouring off of his mm-hmm. brow and his hair. You know, he had it long and it would like roll down his face. And he would look very disheveled and just, gosh, put yourself in my client's shoes. He grew up and he was adopted and he had such a hard life and he grew up in poverty and his and in the midst of domestic violence and he had no good examples and, you know, but for, you know, maybe a few tweaks to his childhood, maybe he wouldn't have committed these crimes, but now he has, and now he's punished with life imprisonment. But if we take the extra step and if we decide to execute this young man, understand what we're doing. And then we'd go into Mm -hmm. it and we'd argue it from that perspective, not attacking the victims, families, not being offended at the people that would, dare chastise him for defending such a man, which it seems, you know, a lot of what's going on here. Yep. Um, but he would stand arms wrapped around his client and acknowledge fully, yes, I'm defending this young man because he deserves an advocate. And I am his advocate. And whatever you have to say to my client, if you want to say it to me, that's okay with me. If you want to think that karma is going to come down and the universe shall dictate my future based on my actions in this case, I accept that proposition. But I'm going to defend this young man because it is his job, or it is my job, Mm -hmm. and it is his constitutional right, and I believe it's the right thing to do. And had the Parkland defense attorneys simply taken that stance, I don't think they would have nearly the same level of um, backlash. But that's not the case. And so instead what we have is their impassioned objections that they renewed several times over where they went in and uh, chastised the judge for refusing to reel in the victim's families. Mm -hmm. And you know what, going back to what they said, what was actually said in the courtroom, it was literally just karma. It was references to karma. You know, you're going to be responsible for your actions essentially without, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing of course. And I think there was one other comment, um, about something, but there's no direct threats, you know? For example, if you want to say, if I was defending the guy where I lost their trial and say, how dare you defend that guy? I accept it. And I don't blame you for saying that because at certain points in my life, I thought the same thing, you know? And I wondered how I would be able to do it. But at the end of the day, I, I had a genuine belief that he was innocent. Chin. Oh yeah. If, 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 you want, if you want to chastise me for defending that guy, I, I get it. Mm-hmm. I understand. What I'm not going to do is take offense and say, hey, direct all your anger at him. He's the one that did it. Mm -hmm. I represented him. So if you want to tell me that the universe has it in for me for doing something that you perceive to be morally incorrect, from my perspective, if somebody accused you of a crime where you convinced me that you were not guilty and you wanted me to convince the world that you were not guilty because you and your heart believe that you were not guilty, you would want somebody like me to defend you. And I would do my damnedest to make sure I got your story out there. And I would present the evidence in a way that sought to prove your case. And we're going to win or we're going to lose. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to represent you every step of the way. And I'm not going to put you out on the island. If we win the case, I will accept the vitriol that comes my way. If we lose the case, um, I'm going to stand there just the same. 
And that's just, that's the job of a defense attorney. Exactly. And to me, as, as a defense attorney, that's the code that they broke. Mm -hmm. They broke that hum, human trait as defense attorneys where we should take in our clients as they are and protect them at all times and not um, make it at all in any way about us. So from, from my perspective, uh, th that's what it is. In terms of um, the judge's conduct, what do you think about the Parkland judge? I have mixed emotions about her. I have some opinions. I'm curious about what you guys thought. And Melissa, you could jump in at any time. Well, um, to be honest with you, I didn't see a lot about this trial. Um, I do have mixed emotions about her, too, because I've seen mainly in TV shows, but also when I watch real life, um, when they actually permit court streams to come th through. For example, when Johnny and Amber were in court, the judge handled things completely different. And there was a lot of arousal and a lot of stuff during the court in the courtroom. And the judge kept quiet, had a calm face. This judge, on the other hand, wasn't that calm. And I do really think that she was not really, um, how do I say this, unbiased. I would say she, of course, had a, a little bit of bias towards him. Uh, not towards him, sorry. You know what I mean. But um, she was not completely like a blank page, like willing to listen to everything. She she kind of had her thing, her feelings. And what really like surprised me the most was when they referenced to her children and she literally went balls into this attorney. Like, Do you think that was inappropriate? I do. Why? Be uh, of course, I'm not a lawyer. I'm saying this out loud. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that you're right or wrong. I'm just curious about your thoughts on it because judges do this all the time and, you know, people have opinions about it. What's your opinion? They do. I do have to, I'm going to break it into two. The first one is, of course, of course, she's a human being. That's the first thing. She has emotions. She has feelings. She's tired. She's fed up. Let's start with that. But in second thought, she's like the head of the courtroom in this way. And she can just like go balls in on somebody when she feels like she's been insulted or humiliated or whatever. She needs to calm down and be like, hey, okay, um, I like your comment. You can save it up for yourself. Like, let's continue. But like going like that on somebody, like it really gets you like, wow. Well, um, I think that you have to work really hard to get a judge mm -hmm. that pissed off at you in a courtroom. Because I don't think that that judge started that way. I think the, the defense team specifically did things. Here's take a look. Do you guys remember this? I'm going to play this for you guys real quick. Before we get into that, there's... um The guy with the crazy motion. All right, yeah, so she's, she's asking who's going to question this next witness. I mean, that would frustrate anybody. She literally could have said that like an hour yes. ago. Yes. <laughs> Look at her face. I mean, it's like WTF. I feel like she's trying to be very patient with them right now. Yes. She gave them every opportunity. Just tell them what you're going to do. That's what I, that's why I, I mentioned she was human because she really is human and I'm sure she was fed up. Yes. Leave it up. <laughs> of course, the prosecution. I haven't. What do you want me to do? You know, they said they had 80 witnesses. They can't do anything. Uncalled for, unprofessional way to try a case. You, you all knew about this. And even if you didn't make your decision until this morning, to have 22 people plus all of this staff and every attorney march into court, be waiting as if it's some kind of game. 
Now I have to send them home. The state's not ready. They're not going to have a witness ready. We have another day wasted. I, I just, I honestly, I have never experienced a level of unprofessionalism in my career. And then the ponytail lady, she does her Karen thing. When she stands up for herself, she does it here. Listen to her. <laughs> That's like the equivalent of like when somebody says, um, as a feminist or as a mother of two, you have to listen to what I have to say because I'm special. And she just, she, she outlines some of the conduct. Coming in late because you don't like my rulings, doing all this stuff, whatever. She managed it great there. To, I, I do remember that one. I was, she really did, did a good job, like, containing herself right there because I would have screamed at them. Yeah, no, that, that video was from, like, a month ago, a month and a half ago. Yes, that one was. So, imagine that continuing to escalate the same way it has. And now we've gone through an uh, emotional uh, reading of the verdict. That's the thing, and then this person referring her kids. Mm -hmm. Well, that that was, I mean, that was the final straw, right? The objections and the way that they had asked for a sidebar, and then she would just, you know, well, let's get into some of that complaint, too, because there was an actual, this is what they said, and this was taken uh, from... That I reminds me of Daryl Brooks' Post. judge. Well, we're going to actually juxtapose that right now, because... Uh, and to be fair, the Daryl Brooks case was a completely different scenario where that judge could not have out, had an outburst like that at Daryl Brooks. And she controlled herself specifically for specific reasons. But this was the heart of the complaint against the Parkland judge. Uh, Florida criminal defense attorneys, they said the judge overseeing sentencing of the shooter in the 2018 Parkland shooting was hostile and demeaning towards defense counsel. Um, conduct that reveals temperament ill-suited to the criminal bench. One of the questions that I got from one of our uh, listeners was, could they really do that? Could they prevent her from uh, hearing criminal cases ever again? And my response to her was, I mean, they're going to try, but mm -hmm. unlikely, highly unlikely. Um, the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers wrote a letter to Chief Judge Ta uh, Jack Tudor of the 17th Judicial Circuit complaining about Broward County Judge Elizabeth Scherer's behavior during sentencing proceedings for 24-year-old Nicholas Cruz. Cruz was convicted of killing 17 people in the February 28th, blah, blah, blah. Um, the president of the Defense Lawyers Association said in Thursday's letter that Judge Scherer's comments and actions during the proceedings were offensive and detrimental to the integrity of the judiciary and the judicial system. He urged the chief judge to address the matter with the judge and take all appropriate steps to ensure she is not in a position to prejudice any other criminal cases. Which is to say, they know that there's nothing going to happen yeah. to this judge, but could you please talk to her and tell her to knock it off? Because that wasn't cool, what you guys did. The image of a judge relegating an elected public defender and his top assistant to go sit in the corner like misbehaving children is offensive and discounts their very vital and difficult role in this system. To be fair to those, okay, I've had some time to think about it. Those, on the last show... Um, the gentleman that got up in defense of the guy that got, was kicked out of the courtroom. Um, I called him smug. I called him arrogant. Because in that moment, you know, we're in the midst of a victim impact statements and everything that I said before in the first 20 minutes of the show about how uh, a defense attorney should behave in those settings holds true. And he's defending his public defenders, and you know, that's his job. He was called on to do that, and he was attempting to do that. And he did ask for a sidebar, which is fair. Should the judge have took him up on a sidebar issue? Yeah, I think that would have spared the public defender's office a lot of scrutiny. And it would have probably saved the judge from a lot of scrutiny herself. There wouldn't be some formal complaint that would have probably been appropriate. They could have had a screaming match in judges' chambers and said all that she wanted to say. Instead, they got it all in front of the families of uh, the victims. And the result of that was an escalation of the victim impact statements in that they started, oh, you thought it was bad before, our little karma statements. Now they're flipping the bird of the public defenders, uh, the Manuel Olivers, you know, flipping them the bird. And 
um, you know, saying, how dare you? Uh, what did I go through? And, you know, those kinds of statements. And so it made it a lot worse. Should she have done the sidebar? Yeah, she should have done the sidebar. Do I blame her uh, for, for, you know, having an emotional outburst? Um, very rarely do I blame people for their emotional outbursts in court like that because trial is chaotic. Trial is emotional. Um, it's draining. Your nerves are fried. Uh, your patience is tested in ways that you couldn't even imagine. And so to say that she was right or wrong, who knows? But should she have done something different? Yeah, probably. Because the result was this moment in judicial history is going to be memorialized, um, you know, when people are referencing, you know, the the temperaments of the judge and whether or not uh, the public defenders were, um, how they defended their clients and how they uh, attacked the families of the victims. And so it became a highlighted moment to the <laughs> max when it could have all just went under the rug with a simple sidebar. So I have some sympathy for the public defenders in that regard. Um, what I cannot defend is them insisting on the objections. <sighs> I get people's points where they should be protected from having their children threatened. But I went back and I, I listened to the comments again. Are they really threats? The worst of the worst, they weren't really threats. Like if somebody said, I'm going to find you in the parking lot and find your children, that's different. That's one thing. But all they really said was the karma, karma is going to take care of you. Karma will deal with you. You know, what you did was wrong. You can say that to me as much as you want. I mean, I that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, you're, making, you're, holding, you're telling me that I'm accountable for my actions, which, which I already mm -hmm. agree. I already agree to that. And so to that regard, um, you know, I'm not offended. And there was no direct threats on the children. You know, were there unsavory comments? Mildly. I mean, I've, honestly, I've seen a lot worse um, in person in some of these victim impact statements. And so I'm going to close the book on that specific issue. Um, now, let's... Um, juxtapose that with uh, the Daryl Brooks judge. Okay, so you have this case in Parkland and the defense attorneys, the defense attorneys are dealing, you know, they're, they're playing chess with the judge and they're all this gamesmanship and they're, you know, whatever. You think about um, their arguments or objections. This is what the uh, Waukesha County judge was having to deal with. Do you guys mm -hmm. remember uh, this guy? I'm having the jury brought out. I'm instructing you to on, avoid man. the commentary when the jury comes uh, out. Or you will forfeit you say, your right to be present. You, 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 you pick up potential as to a uh, witness by the name of Abel Lescano. He has prior criminal history. Thank you. So as long as the jury's out, we should probably discuss that. I would like to provide the defendant and the court with. So that had to be that had to be said. So it's the defendant. That's not how it was said. That, that was how I said. You want to run the record back? Mr. Brooks. So I'm the only one. I got one. Mr. I got Brooks. one ear that work and I heard that. This on, is man. to benefit on, you so that no, you not. understand Ain't none your of this to witness me, so let's has be clear a prior about that. record. Your Honor, when I leave the table, I'm away from the courtroom and I have to elevate my voice. This is the so alleged record of Abel Lescott. Stop talking. Man. Oh, man. Like, I don't know who y'all been thinking y'all fooling. I'll set the value in return for value. <laughs> One more interruption and you're going to be removed to the next court. That's what you want to do anyway. It's not what I want to do. Do not interrupt Attorney Opper. So can Your you Honor, tell, I can believe he sleep? has seven prior criminal convictions. The yeah, OWI second from 1997, an OWI third from 1997, an OWI fourth from 2003, Criminal trespass to dwelling from 2006. Right, I need to take a break. This man right now is having a stare down with me. It's very disrespectful. He pounded his fist. Frankly, it makes me scared. And we're taking a break. So that's what that judge was having to put up with. I mean, this, this, the stare down and the, the childish. Well, let's, and let's juxtapose this to this. Um, in Parkland, she was dealing with defense attorneys. So they went to law school. They know the law. They should be aware of the protocol. <clears throat> Here, unfortunately, yeah, we know what kind of people, what kind of person she was dealing with. I remember when I said on the last show that some of my least favorite people in the world are attorneys. Mm -hmm. Well, because, you know, sometimes they do this, that this thing where... Um, 
like the the Parkland defense attorneys yeah. were doing, where they, they play games with the judge and they mm-hmm. they complicate things or they're they're trying to do gamesmanship or, or whatever. The the job in the Waukesha case was a lot different. Mm-hmm. That guy was a, not an attorney. He was acting like a child. He's already in prison. He knows he's not ever going to get out. So what was her remedy? What, I'm going to hold him in contempt? Mm -hmm. And he's already in jail, you know? And if she holds him in contempt, it's going to delay the entire proceedings. So either I'm going to do that or I'm just going to kick him out to the other room. And that's what she ended up doing Mm -hmm. the majority of the time. Remove him to the other courtroom and he could scream and yell and make uh, forts out of his discovery all he wants. And so it was not the same thing. She had to maintain her composure Mm -hmm. because she was a essentially babysitting him so they could get through that trial. This was the opposite. The defense attorneys in that case, or in, 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 the, in, in the Parkland case, were purposefully, um, you know, maneuvering mm-hmm. to try to break the trial, get a mistrial, um, you know, try to catch the, the prosecution off guard, making it as difficult for the judge as possible for no reason. But they have law degrees, and they know how to do it in a way. Um, that looks cute. Well, that, you know, it's not even that it looks cute. It's just they make arguments. They, uh, they're they structuring mm-hmm. the way that the witnesses are going to, going to come out. They are, um, you know, they're do- making certain objections that are based in law and fact that the judge has to contend with. Um, and they're trying to hold their cards close to the vest, and, they're you know, they're doing all this stuff. Um, and you heard the judge just, look, guys— Who's going to question the witness, right? At that point, they know that they're going to yes. rest their case. Why don't they just say that? Yes, Why exactly. don't they just say that? If I'm a judge and I'm just saying, who is going to be questioning your next witness? And then the next thing after we have this whole back and forth for two mm-hmm. minutes out of your mouth is, oh, the defense rests. You couldn't have told me that two minutes ago, you know? Like, we wasted all of this time because, hey, what are you guys trying to do? Like, what do you think you're accomplishing? The jury's not even in the room at that point. And so it's literally just the judge, the attorneys, and Nicholas Cruz and whoever was in the courtroom at the time. She was just tired of them, their whole game and BS. And, of course, she understands what they're doing, and she was tired. I've seen a lot of judges like this. Like, some judges, they let all the fiasco happen, and they don't say anything. And there's others that they just simply don't allow it in their courtroom, and they call the attorney's out. Yeah. And I don't have a problem. Well, I have personally never been yelled at by a judge the way that the Parkland defense attorneys have, Mm -hmm. but I also have enough sense to know when to shut up, you know, when, especially when we're in trial, I try to make it as easy as possible for the judge. I try to let them know the order of my witnesses. You know, I may call this person. I might call this person. I'm going to need this much time for everybody. But that's kind of just the rules of court. You got to, yeah. at least in California, there's rules of court. You got to provide a witness list, an exhibit list, a trial brief so the judge knows where you're going with stuff. If there's special stuff that arises during trial, I will ask for a sidebar or I'll ask for objections, but I'm not going to sit there and try to play games with everybody mm-hmm. and hide the ball about, you know, order of witnesses or whatnot, especially not on that day. Now, look, I could have 30 witnesses on my exhibit list and I don't know which one I'm going to call. I'm not going to call them Mm -hmm. one through 30, you know, depending on how the trial goes, I might call witness 27 because he's going to rebut Mm -hmm. something that their witness said or or something that came up at trial. That's going to specifically address something specific. I might not even call all 30 witnesses. And that happens a lot. Sometimes I have 30 witnesses on there. I might call three, but that's only because I've got enough to hit all the elements of my case and um, everything else is going to be redundant. So let's just cut this short. Um, especially if I'm doing a bench trial, I'll tell the judge that your honor, I have, a, I have 12 witnesses. Um, they're all here ready to go, but if this is not an issue for you specific, exactly. whatever. And sometimes the judges be like, ah, I've already heard from this, mm-hmm. you know, um, or they'll sometimes they'll be silent, but I've already heard enough on this issue. We don't have to get into that. All right, fine. So I'm not going to call these witnesses. I'll bring this other person. So we get to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But I'm trying to make it as easy as for everybody. Cause we're trying to, we got to make a living, you yeah. know? Attorneys are in there. We're trying to get in and out. And if we don't have to waste time, we generally like to not do that. Mm-hmm. So um, as far as the conduct of the Parkland judge, I feel that the defense attorneys kind of brought it on themselves. Mm-hmm. I get the sense from listening to that judge and the way that she conducted herself that had the defense attorneys conducting themselves differently, she would not have had the, these screaming matches with mm-hmm. the judges. 
Like she was so ready to just move on. I feel like she's a, a matter of fact, no nonsense type of judge. She's not there to disrespect anybody, but she's there to keep things going. But if you play games with her, you're going to piss exactly. her off, yes. which, you know, it's kind of how I prefer my judges to be, mm-hmm. you Me know, too. Um, where she got into a little bit of trouble was at the end. I don't know if you recall, but there was at the end of the victim impact statements after the sentencing mm-hmm. where she sentenced Nicholas Cruz a life. Um, she was hugging some of the prosecutors after the trial. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, and a lot of people were saying, oh, well, that's obviously shows how she, how biased she was towards the prosecution. Mm-hmm. And to that degree, I've never hugged a judge like that before yeah. at the end of my trial um, or gotten remotely close to doing anything like that. I have sat in judges' chambers at the end of trials uh, to discuss different things, but, you know, out of the public eye, you know, whatever. And when I did that, both attorneys were in the room. So if there's anything that looked bad, I agree that that kind of looked yeah, bad. Yeah, that looks a little bit inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. And so should she have done that? I mean, I don't know. But like I said, they've been dealing with this case for a year. And at the end of it, you know, I mean, they all work with each other. They see each other every single day. And past this trial, they're going to continue to, to litigate things mm-hmm. in front all of each pieces. other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you develop relationships with people in the courtroom and friendships and things like that. And um, just because she gives a hug to the uh, prosecutors in that case, I don't necessarily believe that there's any bias there. Mm-hmm. I think had the public defenders um, not uh, gone out of their way to make the objections that they did. Um, if there were hugs being offered in the courtroom, I don't think that that would have been out of line to have everybody hugging each other. I've never seen that person in the courtroom. So I don't really know really what to say to that. The fact that it happened, yeah, it looked, it looked bad, only in that I've never seen it happen personally in my career in a courtroom. But the fact that it happened, I guess I could understand um, the emotions behind all of that and why, uh, why that would happen. Mm-hmm. Um, did you have anything to add, Eliana? Um, no. I think I'm, I mean, I haven't had the chance to do to watch a lot of the videos. So I think you pretty much covered like the things that are out there on the news sounding on the article. So, yeah. There, there, there's new, um, well, there's more stuff on the, on the complaint that came out. Some of the allegations um, or some of the stuff that, that came out in that complaint was that the judge needs to be a neutral magistrate to go and hug one side. I think that's mm-hmm. inappropriate, whatever side. This is from an interview taken from, uh, I guess it was Ernest Chang of the Florida Association of Criminal Defense. He w- he went on um, WSVN and gave an interview, and he was given his perspective about it. And one of the things he says, yeah, it's emotional, it's traumatic, uh, but the judge needs to be neutral to hug one side. I think that's inappropriate, which is kind of what we're saying. And I agree, yeah, maybe, but I understand why it happened. Um, Chang said he's less concerned about the hugging then exchanges between the judge and shooter's defense team. Um, now, please go sit down. You're inappropriate and out of line, Sher said to the chief assistant public defender, David Wheeler, on Tuesday. The last phase of the sentencing trial began with the victim's heartbroken families finally having their say to the man who killed their loved ones, but some aimed their words at his public defenders. Karma. Karma. This is what you owe for the rest of your miserable lives, said Patricia Oliver, the month the mother of victim Joaquin Oliver, Uh, You obviously have a very high tolerance for murder. I do remember that comment, actually. God knows what you're showing your kids on television. That was the main one. What you're showing your kids on television. Those are the comments. That's not a threat. It's just a reference. Um, How could you sit there listening to what he did and not say that this is the worst of the worst? Uh, I guess one of the comments was my client, what he did is not the worst of the worst, Mm -hmm. which um, begs the question, well, how much worse does it get? (laughs) Killing 17 folks and the way that he did. Um, Lead defense attorney, Melissa McNeil. I I think that that was the one with the ponytail, you know, the one that was making that objection where she says, for you to chastise me in front of my client, I have to stand up for myself. And then she was making all those arguments and the objections for the victim impact statements. Um, She says, I did my job and every member of this team did their jobs. Judge, and we should not personally be attacked for that, nor should our children. We actually read that comment or saw that comment in one of the Mm -hmm. videos. Um, McNeil was backed by her boss. Broward County Public Defender Gordon Weeks, and this issue continued to escalate. If they were talking about your children, you would definitely notice it. You need to sit down right now. You're out of line. So they're just going over mm-hmm. a lot of the same stuff we've already been over. Um, 
I understand the complaints, but ultimately I don't think anything's happened to no. this Parkland judge. Um, I think uh, both sides, defense attorneys and judges, uh, well, the judge in this case, are going to be scrutinized. Um, you know, in law school, in, in mock trial, one of the things that they teach you when you're cross-defending or cross-examining a witness is when you have an uncooperative witness, you can't just go in and start screaming at them, you know, like you're, um, you know, whoever. You have to, the jury has to give you permission to do that to a witness, right? The only reason I bring that up is because in the Daryl Brooks case, I haven't heard a single negative thing said about that <laughs> Waukesha judge uh, because that guy was so out of line that everybody understands. And she went out of her way um, to uh, give him leeway to whatever. And uh, everybody understands what was going on and they sympathize with the judge in that case. These Parkland officials, um, it's a little bit different in that there's different perspective. I got to say it's probably 90-10 people in f favor of the, of, the, of the judge in this case over the Parkland people. And the main people that were on the defense side were actual defense attorneys. Defense, yeah. And I get their perspective that, yeah, um, some of the stuff on how it came out, mm -hmm. I completely get it. But at the same time, I, I think when they're making those objections at the victim impact statements and when they're playing that gamesmanship with the judge, mm -hmm. you know, what the people are seeing is the judges having to put up with the defense's conduct. And now it's pissing off the people and the people want to see the judge reprimand the defense team. And that's what happens. And from the people that are defending the defense team, they're looking at it from the, from their perspective. It's like, Hey, I got to work with this judge too. And they're screaming. And I said, obviously everything that we said and did, you know, she objected to, and she was totally on the, on the, on the, on the prosecution side. And sometimes that happens in cases it has nothing to do with impartiality. It's just sometimes you have a bad case and your objections suck. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your conduct, uh, yes. such as what they're doing, is lending itself to the judge getting really angry at you. And what do you expect her to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, what would have changed the narrative from your perspective if she granted one of those objections? If she, I mean, I understand the sidebar thing. Totally fair. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, what happened, I don't know. I think that we should kind of just leave that how it is. Um, there's not really much, much more <laughs> needs to be said with respect to that case. But all I'm going to say is I understand why the defense attorneys would defend the Parkland defense team. Um, but I much more firmly understand why the judge got as upset as she did. And the most egregious thing that she may have done that I would have advised her against doing is hug the prosecution team at the end of those yes. hearings. I think that's the worst. Yes. <laughs> but that's it. Mm -hmm. As far as everything else, I think it was all fair game. Um, we had a, some of our listeners comment, and I wanted to highlight uh, one of our uh, listeners, the Canadian cat lady. She says she watched the trial all the way through. She listened to the parents, families, and friends speak about their loved ones. I keep going back and listening to them quite often, and I'm sure I will rewatch again. She said, I came across your site, which I hadn't seen before, and I had been looking and hoping to find this case being watched, and as it is being played here, would be a couple of really good lawyers to add their input to what was going on, and I never came across anyone until today, tonight, and I found you guys. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I can't imagine what those parents have been going through. Every Valentine's Day, they have to, really re they have to relive this day, and it's sickening that he chose this day and those uh, oh, she had some choice words I'm sure they <laughs> thought uh, of it as well I wish you could go back to the start of the trial and go over it with I'm sure many viewers like myself maybe we will um, in the future you never know whatever people whatever our listeners want us to do listen, we're going to yeah. pretty much do <laughs> um, there was another one Daniel Pickens this is one of the ones that was really upset with us she says that you're all wrong you are all lawyers and you know how wrong it is you're acting like biased non-attorneys um, well me and Eliana are, are very um, much actual attorneys yes. <laughs> um, very much actually practicing but she says shame on you they had to put up with the judge throwing clearly biased tantrums in front of the world she blatantly acted like she was new to the law and was clearly accepting advice from the state uh, I disagree with that. I don't think she was accepting advice from the state. I don't think she came across as being near the law. I don't know how long she's been a judge. She does look fairly young. Mm -hmm. 
but I want to go so far as to say that she's new to the law as if she didn't know what was going on. She seems like she's been doing this for a while. Um, and I just think that the prosecution, it feels that way because she was mostly uh, making rulings for the prosecution. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that's just how it goes. But I think that some of the defense objections and some of the motions that they were making were asinine. There was at one point, I think a month and a half ago, where the, the defense team actually asked the, the judge to recuse herself. So this actually came up. I don't have video of it or anything. <laughs> but the judge, um, the, the defense attorneys made a motion that the judge in this case should recuse herself from the trial because of her bias, her clear bias uh, towards everybody. Number one, if the judge grants that motion, it's like an ad implicit admission. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, I've been pretty biased in this case. Um, I haven't been fair, and that would have been grounds for a mistrial. Mm -hmm. Obviously, she wasn't going to do that. Um, but this happened maybe a month prior to all of the other stuff that had gone on. Um, that was, you know, most of, in my experience, most offense motions are either to exclude evidence or to do different things, but they're hard to do and they're hard to prove. And most of them are, are, are rejected. And so I don't know how uh, true or untrue that would be. I just didn't see it the same way. Um, where did I leave off? The point of trial is for each side to impeach the credibility of the defendant. I agree. The witnesses and the other attorneys, she did not abuse and embarrassed the state when they said the same as the defense when they spoke in response to the victims. But she didn't say that enough. I've heard both sides. She is who brought... Okay, so I guess her main complaint is that she didn't acknowledge that I heard from both sides. And based on what both sides are saying, I'm making my ruling on this. Too often it was, I've heard your objection and enough is enough. I'm, you know, summarily dismissing you. By the way, I got to clip that and add that to one of my... Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> that was what I, was <laughs> I wanted to get the summarily dismissed comment in there. Um, anyway, that was one of the one of the uh, people that were defending the judge in the case. Um, another listener had a question for us, and maybe I could, I'll, I'll ask you this one, Eliana. Um, the heart of it is this is a criminal case. Um, I believe that the lady is from Kansas. Uh, she took a, her son takes a plea deal. So whatever it was, her, her son is, is entered into a plea and she's not happy with, I don't know what the charge was. I don't know what it was labeled with, but basically the general question is this. He pled guilty to a crime and, you know, the mom is having a hard time reconciling what he was charged with and how he's been unfairly labeled by that charge. And I guess the, the general question would be, could we go back and change the plea or get him to plead something else? The general answer to that question is no. I'm not a defense attorney in Kansas, but in California, when you enter a plea, it's generally um, considered sort of like a contract. You pled guilty and you've negotiated something. The district attorney, they've agreed not to prosecute you, prosecute you to the max. In exchange for their leniency, you've pled to something. Um, there's several ways you could get rid of that. Um, and they're very, very limited. There's a motion to vacate a plea. You could vacate a plea based on ineffective assistance of counsel. I mean, you had a bad attorney and you were ill-advised of your rights, but that's a very, very high standard to prove. Very difficult to do. Um, you could say uh, objection because you weren't in your right mental state. Um, it could be capacity issues. But generally, if you pled to something, you're stuck with that plea. There's not really any going back on it except... Maybe the judge throws out the plea deal because you entered a guilty plea and the judge reviews the plea agreement and says, you know what? I'm not signing this. You guys are going to have to do something else. And he'll give the defendant at that point, if you want to withdraw your plea, I will withdraw it on the spot, but I'm not going to accept this plea agreement the way that it was drafted up. Um, what do you think about her question, Eliana? Well, most of the time, um, I mean, I deal a lot with the uh, Riverside um, County. And if I'm not mistaken, the form even has one of the things that the... Uh, one of the things that the defendant agrees to is that they're not going to, they're giving up their right to appeal the case by entering into this plea. Um, also, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to be rude, but I think if she's the one having the issue with the label that is being uh, given to her son, she's the one that needs to seek therapy, <laughs> not change the, <laughs> not change the, the plea deal. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yes. Well, to, I don't know. I've had family members that were convicted of crimes and labeled as certain things. Mm -hmm. And 
I have parents come to me all the time yeah. when their children commit crimes. For really bad crimes. Mm-hmm. And what I always tell the parents is, I don't know if your son did this or not. I understand that this is a very ugly charge. And oftentimes your child will be in prison, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, 25 years old or whatever. He's incarcerated, so I got to go do a jail visit. But my clients are their children. And I represent the child who's not Mm -hmm. a child. He's a grown man or a Mm -hmm. grown woman. But whatever they tell me, I can't just go telling the mom, oh, yeah, he definitely did it. He admitted to me. Mm -hmm. And so what what I'll say is, look, I understand if you want to hire an attorney and throw thousands of dollars at this. But why don't you let me go speak to him and see, get some of the facts. And what I could do is maybe I could tell you if he has a good case or a bad case. And maybe it's not a good idea to waste your money or put up your house uh, to pay a defense attorney to try to make this disappear. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll do something like that. And without going into any details, you know, look, I, had, I spoke with your son and um, I... If you want me to represent you on this case, I will, but it doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'll say. The charges are what they are. And it's very like, for example, in the case of like a sexual assault, Mm -hmm. I've had cases of um, where the, my client was being accused of rape by way of intoxication, the Bill Cosby charge. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, he had sexual intercourse with a young lady that was A, a minor, and B, severely intoxicated. You know, to the point where even if she was old enough, she could not have consented because she was drugged with alcohol, right? And so you try to be as sympathetic as you can, but then you find out that there is uh, cell phone videos circulating of oh, him pouring gallons of tequila down her throat as they're on the dance floor and her like chugging alcohol and the blood alcohol level comes back at uh, 0.28 an hour or or hours after um, she called the police. And now there's this rape kid and lucky she didn't die of alcohol poisoning. Um, You can't tell all, you can't tell the family all of those things. No. (laughs) And so then they get very upset with me and then they get second and third and fourth opinions, which I highly recommend. Yeah, do that, do that. Uh, But if there's an attorney out there that says that they're going to make all of that stuff go away. uh, I'm telling you right now, you have a bad case. I can't tell you what they have because, you know, attorney client privilege. I mean, I, I could, you know, speak generally about, you know, what's known, but you know, what I speak about with, with their son, I can't go and, and say those things. But it's very difficult to have a family that's a, a family member that's accused of, accused of a crime. A few shows ago, I had my dad on who was accused of a crime. Eliana, were you there for that one? No, you I missed. actually, I think you that's were stranded the week, in Puerto Rico, right? Yeah, that I was yeah. stranded. Yeah, you were trapped in the darkness of uh, Puerto Rico without electricity and, and water and, <laughs> and internet, nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we had my dad on the show, and he was accused of a crime, and uh, I had to. Uh, well, there was a whole show that we did on that. And yeah, it's difficult when you have family members. And the what Eliana said about maybe you should seek therapy, that's not a joke. I think that mm-hmm. I it had happens. to seek therapy um, for what I had to endure in that case because it's hard on the people that are accused of the crime, but it's very hard on the families. It's hard on the, fi- the victims. When you commit a crime... It's not a zero-sum game. I mean, there's a ripple effect. Uh, Everybody is affected from family members of the defendants to the family members of the victim. You know, there could be children involved. Uh, There's a lot that goes on. And so... Yeah, my question will be, maybe can she ask the son if the son is actually okay or he likes the plea deal that he entered because well he likes it because he entered into it i mean maybe that was he knows what happened so maybe that was better than just going through trial or anything else and i mean a lot of times children just don't tell their parents what they did because they're embarrassed and they're they don't want to disappoint more their parents than what they are already doing by just being charged with a crime. Well, that's, so. the, that's the case. And oftentimes, um, when I'm visiting my clients, for example, in prison, is there anything you want me to tell your mom or dad? Mm-hmm. Just tell them that I love them. Obviously, yeah. don't tell them what I did, exactly. but just tell them that I love them. <laughs> um, which I, you know, yeah, I'm not going to just, I'm not going to tell my mom that I just uh, sexually assaulted somebody or, you know, the truth of that. I'm going to tell her that I didn't do it. And then, mm-hmm. 
if we go to trial, all those facts are coming out, and that's why people take plea deals, because they don't want those details getting out. Oftentimes, criminal cases are uh, decided, you know, I think this statistic is 97% of all criminal charges end in a plea deal of some form or not. And the 3% others are, are going to trial, and there's a percentage of those that are found guilty and not guilty. Um, it's really hard to win a case. You know, if you're accused of a crime, it's very difficult to get to a, a, a not guilty verdict. You have to actually be not guilty for one. That's not true. You don't have to actually. No. There's no. been many times where people that have committed crimes mm -hmm. have been found not guilty and then mm -hmm. come to find out DNA evidence, you know, would have solved the case, but it wasn't available back mm -hmm. in the day. But the point being, um, as you guys know, when you go to trial, everything is, is, is getting out. All mm -hmm. If there's video out there, if there's police reports, the victims are going to come out and say a lot of unsavory stuff. Um, I once represented my brother in a, um, in a, in a case uh, that had some very in, uh, embarrassing sexual stuff come out um, where we won his case. But in the course of winning his case, um, all of this embarrassing stuff had to come out. And um, his parents were there in the courtroom to hear all of that. And then I'm sitting here looking at the A. Dude, WTF. <laughs> by, by the way, um, my mother listens to our show regularly. She's one of our first and most <laughs> loyal uh, listeners, viewers of this show. And she offered critiques of me. And one of the critiques was uh, she said that I cursed too much on the show. It's like, and I, she told me this. I'm like, <laughs> bullshit, I cursed too much. <laughs> and then I go, no, you listen back. You said the F word like eight times. I counted. It's like, wow, oh, I doubt I said it that much. And I went back and I listened. Yeah, I, I did kind of. Yeah, I, I apologize for that to my mom. Um, the other thing that she said was, as a feminist... I don't like how you had the girls on the couch like there. It's like you were sitting on your throne. And so <laughs> because of that, we've adjusted the cameras to where Ileana is now up here with me at the table and Melissa's still on the couch, but it's not everybody's packed together like sardines. That was actually another comment from one of our listeners, but she straight up gave me the, as a feminist, I was like, oh, mom, I almost did the Donald Trump thing. I'm the biggest feminist that there is. There's no greater <laughs> feminist than I. You know, I didn't do that. Oh, um, I, you know. I'm not going to argue with my mom. I just changed the setting. I appreciate the comments. Yeah, you're never going to win that argument. Oh, I always win. And so, but I always end up doing what she asked me to do anyway. <laughs> I'm not a mama's boy, but I'm a very respectful son, is what I would say to that. Um, well, we've been going for an hour 11, but what I wanted to uh, talk about really briefly was, um, did you guys get a load of the uh, Kim Kardashian settlement that just came out? Do you guys invest in crypto at all? No. No. Not at all. Really? Not even like a Bitcoin, Ethereum, none of that. Well, I got into it. Um, I, I didn't do, do remember very well. when that happened. <laughs> My husband, I think he did. He has been reading a book about it, but I really haven't paid any attention to it. I haven't personally. <laughs> Are you guys familiar with, with securities? It's, it's basically a, a statement. It's literally a paper that says this paper is redeemable for value of something. Yeah. That's basically mm -hmm. what it is. Stocks, bonds, Bitcoin, yeah. those kinds of things. So Kim Kardashian gets involved with this company called Emacs. And um, there was an agreement where she almost found herself in federal prison because uh, she was endorsing this Emacs token. These were the facts of the case. Um, Kardashian, who's 41 years old, Jesus Christ, she's that old. Uh, she promoted a crypto asset security on her Instagram account in exchange for money. She received about $250,000 uh, for a promotion. And at the time of her promotion, she had 225 million Instagram followers. And I get excited over our, our 20,000 views. Our little. I think she's like the fourth 20, or views. fifth women, woman most followed on yeah, Instagram. Something like that. Yeah, something I don't even know what 225, that's like the that's entire that. United States population, isn't it? Or 300 million? Anyway, um, so she has 225 million Instagram followers. She promoted a securities offering conducted by Ethereum Max which I had not heard of prior to uh, this agreement. It's an online company. They have a public website. Um, it offered and sold Emacs tokens 
to the general public as one of these tokens. Celebrity tokens has been all the rage, and people have been getting a lot of trouble with that with the SEC. Uh, so she promoted um, the Emacs tokens promoted by Kardashian were offered and sold as investment contracts and therefore securities pursuant to Section 2A1 of the Securities Act from 1933. Um, starting on approximately May 14th, 2021, Ethereum Max made the Emacs tokens available for public trading on decentralized crypto asset trading platform. Based on Ethereum Max's marketing materials, as well as public statements by Ethereum Max's affiliates, um, the Ethereum Max website and Ethereum Max social media handles purchasers of blah, blah, blah. Based on Ethereum, based on their public statements, uh, bottom line, let me just bottom line it. They gave her $250,000 to promote these tokens. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to do that without disclosing it, which is what she did, which she did. Mm -hmm. So on her Instagram she writes this post, and I'll just put it into view for the people watching on YouTube um, and for the people um, listening only to the podcast. It says, are you guys into crypto? This is not financial advice, but sharing what my friends just told me about the Ethereum Max token. A few minutes ago, Ethereum Max burned 400 trillion tokens, literally 50% of their admin wallet, giving back to the entire Emacs community. Swipe up for more details or something like that, right? Promoting this token, not disclosing the fact that in exchange for doing that, they gave her $250,000. That is a violation of Section 17B of the Securities Act, which, which says specifically, it's unlawful for any person to publish, give publicity to, circulate any notice, circular advertisement, newspaper article, or whatever, uh, directly or indirectly, from an issuer, underwriter, or dealer without fully disclosing the receipt, whether past or prospective, of such consideration and the amount thereof. You could go to jail for years in federal prison for such a violation. So they caught her doing it. They come up with this agreement with the SEC, basically stating um, that she's going to give the money back and she's going to make whoever might have lost money in the investment scheme whole by covering their losses. Um, the disgorgement and prejudice, um, preju I can't even talk. I've lost my ability to talk <laughs> an hour 16 in. The disgorgement and prejudgment interest referenced in paragraph 4C is consistent with equitable principles and does not exceed respondents' net profits from her violations and will be distributed to harmed investors and investors if feasible. So she's going to give the money back that she received and she's going to make the investors whole. In exchange for not going to jail. Yeah. Oh. yeah. She had to do that. Otherwise, <laughs> she was not going to be able to get her attorney license. But that's not even all. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. That. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot that she's actually an attorney. No, no, um, no. Not, not yet. yet. Not, not yet. yet. But, but she passed the bar, though, right? No, no the baby, the baby bar. bar. Oh, she hasn't. She's not an actual. No. So oh. she's going to law school the non-traditional way mm -hmm. because California is right, one of right. the Right, right. I heard states. about that. But I thought she passed the bar, no? The baby, baby. one. So she could continue I with her see. legal education. I see. Well, yeah. I, I had imagined that that's going to put a stain on her um, her background check exactly. here in California. The character. So in addition to having to pay back the money and make the investors whole, she also has to cooperate with the SEC uh, for whatever other criminal activity that they might mm -hmm. uh, be able to expose. Um, it says here, respondent shall, respondent being Kim Kardashian, within 20 days of the entry of this order, pay disgorgement, and that's basically giving the money back, $250,000 prejudgment interest of $10,415, and a civil money penalty in the amount of $1 million to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, so I thought that that was interesting. So if anybody out there is listening and thinking about investing in some of these celebrity token, I'm not a financial advisor. Do so at your own <laughs> risk. I wouldn't recommend it. But again, um, you should probably uh, listen to somebody that's more attuned to that than I. Um, I'll stay. I, I tend to keep my investments a lot safer than those peddled by celebrities such as Kim Kardashian. But I will reserve uh, judgment on that. Um, and with that, do any of you guys have anything else to add uh, for episode 17? Uh, no. Nope. What I would say is if any of you have any questions or have anything that you'd like us to discuss on episode 18 or going forward or in general, you can always inst instant. 
I swear. I've, <laughs> I can't, I can no longer, I, I can no longer talk. Um, who knows? Maybe I'm, I'm coming down. I've been fighting something off all week. Like our whole office has been wiped out for yesterday and you know, half our office is still out by half. I mean, Jocelyn. 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 <laughs> yeah. And then, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to speak. Um, for episode 18, if you want us to cover anything specific, leave a comment down um, in the comments down below, and I will be happy to pick it up. And if it's worthwhile, definitely talk about it. If you have any questions you want us to address, please do that. You can find us every uh, Friday um, on the podcast platform of your choice, whether it be um, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever it is, CastBox. Um, you can find our, our podcast as the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. Uh, we air our shows and episodes every Friday afternoon. We usually record on Thursdays. And so you can find us there. And of course, you could always watch us on the YouTube channel. And um, if, you've just, if you're just finding us for the first time, welcome. And um, tell all your friends about us. And... We're going to continue to keep doing what we do and put out content the way that we've been putting it out and tackle the issues that people want to hear the most. And with that, I guess we will see you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all for listening to the entire podcast. We really do appreciate that. And as always, you can find us on YouTube on the Tilted Lawyer Podcast YouTube channel or on your podcast carrier of choice. If you feel we've presented anything of value, please leave a five-star rating, like, and subscribe. We always appreciate that kind of thing. And we do look forward to seeing you all again live every Thursday at 3 in the afternoon. We love you all. Take care.